My lecture uh, is composed of two parts. Uh, the first part, um, in the first part, I will deal with the environmental responses to past climate changes, and the second part of my talk will be uh, will be focused on um, the oceanic and atmospheric processes uh, that bring the Earth to glaciation and also those associated with ice melting. First, I'm going to define what is climate. Climate is not the weather. Climate is the sum of meteorological phenomena that characterizes the mean state of the atmosphere, ILOS temperature, precipitation, greenhouse gas concentration, and that over 30 years is an arbitrary time. Eh? It could be 25, 40, but they decided 30 years. But this uh, uh, main state of the atmosphere depends in turn on the dynamics of the various components of the climate system. I mean the uh, sea ice, the ocean, the ice sheets, the vegetation and the land surfaces, as you will see later. Uh, but uh, why climate uh, is different from one region to another is because it's controlled by insulation. And insulation is the amount of energy that the Earth receives from the Sun per surface unit by season and latitude. In fact, the, the uh, energy arrives uh, from the Sun uh, to the Earth uh, at every latitude, but in the poles, this radiation spread over a large area. It means that each point on the surface receives a weak amount of energy. On the contrary, at the equator, the radiation fo focus on a small area. It means that each point receives a big amount on, of energy. And that creates a dissymmetry between asymmetry between the equator. And to equilibrate, to counterbalance this asymmetry of energy, we have the ocean currents and winds, and particularly the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is uh, the North Atlantic part of the Atlantic Meridional Overturner Circulation, or AMOC. This uh, um, Gulf Stream is bringing uh, humidity and uh, uh, warm to the high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, but ma mainly to Europe, because it's pushed by the westerlies, and the westerlies uh, uh, are forced by the Coriolis force that goes from the west to the east. Uh, therefore, when you have uh, this uh, uh, warm uh, surface water uh, going little by little uh, to the north uh, is densifying because it's uh, finding uh, cold, uh, cold waters. And uh, in, in this part, uh, mainly in the Nordic Seas, but also in the Labrador Sea and north of Iceland, this da dense water uh, sink. And by sinking, in fact, uh, it uh, releases heat, you know, in this part of the North Atlantic, the western part, but mainly in the Nordic Seas. After sinking, the formation of deep water is crossing all the oceans and arriving to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, um, there is a very high sea mountain and this deep water is going up in a more shallow position and also is warming up. And this warm is little by little directed towards the Gulf of Mexico amplifying the warming of this uh, region. The distribution of the heat, uh, of the heat in, uh, in our planet uh, due to the conveyor belt uh, lasts more or less 2,000 years. You can see here, for instance, in the southern Europe, you have Mediterranean vegetation, forest, and at the same latitude, you have temperate forest. Farther north, the temperate forest in, uh, in uh, more uh, northern latitudes in Europe coincide with a, a boreal forest in North America. Finally, the boreal forest in Europe coincides with the tundra in North America. But also, the distribution of the uh, marine organism is also affected by this dissymmetry between both sides of the North Atlantic. And here you can see as an example the uh, polar foraminifera Pachyderma sinistral, Neoglobocuadrina Pachyderma sinistral, 
that uh, is living in cold waters, in cold surface waters, and you can see that in the eastern part of the North Atlantic, you have the, uh, the highest percentages of this polar foraminifera is uh, above 70 degrees north, while in the western part is at 60 degrees north. But, uh, in fact, uh, this uh, present-day climate, this present-day distribution of uh, different uh, 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 plant and animals um, has changed through time. And you can see here that uh, um, it's because these this, this, uh, changes in climate are due uh, to changes in insulation. And here I'm presenting you the last 600,000 uh, years. This is the summer insulation um, 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 at 65 degree, degree north, where uh, the uh, ice uh, grow, uh, grow and, and decay. These changes in insulation uh, are, uh, um, are produced, changes between interglacial and glacial periods, with a mean a, so, sorry, a dominant cyclicity of 100,000 years during the last one million years. This uh, curve indicating these changes in global ice volume, um, in fact, is produced by the measurement of the oxygen isotopic ratio in the shells, I mean in the uh, calcium carbonate of the a shell of the benthic foraminifera leaving the benthos of the ocean. Therefore, we have a series of glacial interglacial uh, periods, and you can see the difference between an interglacial, the period in which we live now, with uh, all the ice concentrated uh, in Greenland, and uh, the last glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, where the ice arrived, um, reached New York and also uh, London, eh? more or less uh, 50 uh, de degree north. These uh, uh, large changes between glacial and interglacial cycles have really affected uh, the, um, all the uh, terrestrial and marine ecosystems. Why insulation is changing through time? Because insulation, sorry, insulation is um, um, the result of three orbital uh, parameters. Uh, eccentricity, that is the shape of the Earth's trajectory around the Sun, and with a main cyclicity of 100,000 years. When the eccentricity is high, in general, we are in a glacial period. Hmm? The second parameter is obliquity, that is the angle of the Earth's axial tilt that determines seasonality. This angle varies between more or less 22 and 25 uh, degree. When you have the, the, the axis, uh, when the angle is high, uh, the, um, the poles, the north and the south poles, are closer to the, to the sun, and therefore, in general, they determine interglacial periods. And the reverse, in, the, uh, in general, uh, trigger glacial periods. These changes between uh, the angle of the, uh, of the Earth axis um, occur with a cyclicity of 41,000 years. Finally, the third parameter is precession, that is the bobbling motion of the Earth. It means that the, as the Earth uh, is not completely round, you know, is quite thick at the equator, therefore you have the Earth axis that is changing the direction. And sometimes, uh, the uh, Earth axis is pointing to the Sun in summer and far from the Sun in winter, and therefore this indicates a high seasonality. The contrary, when the axis is directed towards uh, the Sun in winter, you have a relatively warm winter and relatively cold summer, indicating low seasonality. The combination of these uh, uh, three uh, orbital parameters give this uh, curve eh, or uh, changes in insulation, and as I told you before, these changes in uh, the, uh, the global ice volume between glacial and interglacial periods. But recently, 
in the uh, in the eighties, it has been discovered uh, the millennial scale climatic variability, the rapid climatic variability. Uh, we cannot think anymore that the climate is changing in a, the very, in a very gradual manner. No, not at all. In the past, the climate has changed, uh, have changed, has changed very abruptly. And here you can see uh, the, um, the curve of the oxygen isotopic ratio of the water, eh, the oxygen of the water, indicating changes in temperature in Greenland during this last glacial period, more or less between 80,000 and 12,000 years before present. Eh, these three marine isotopic stages forming the last glacial uh, period. And the, uh, the, um, the cyclicity of this variability is between 1,000 and 2,000 years, then uh, it cannot be controlled but changes in insulation. This is um, uh, for the Greenland ice core, it was discovered for the first time in this ice core, but after the paleoceanographer started to work uh, in the sedimentary marine sequences uh, with much more resolution. And they found, in fact, that this variability found in the Greenland ice core is also observed in the uh, marine sedimentary sequences. And this is the curve of the uh, of variation in the percentages of the polar foraminifera pachyderma sinistra that I showed you before. Uh, the core was located uh, in front of, of uh, um, Ireland, and you can see that here, at more or less 55 degree north, sometimes you have 100% uh, of the polar foraminifera, indi indicating that they are very, very uh, cold periods, eh, uh, because if now the polar foraminifera, the maximum, is found here, you know, at several times during the last glacial period, the maximum percentage of the foral, foral foraminifera was found further south. Um, also, uh, during some of the cold phases found in Greenland, uh, we find uh, ma ma major ice rafting event. I mean, then the, then, uh, in this core in front of uh, uh, Ireland, uh, there were um, layers characterized by very uh, coarse sediment, as I, tell, uh, I will tell you later. First, I'm going to focus on this uh, uh, variability in Greenland, here, this curve, that was identified by Dansgar Oesger. Uh, it's for this reason that we call Dansgar Oesger cycles. The variability is, uh, as I told you before, between 1,000 and 2,000 years. And what is very important is to see that the warming, towards the right, the warming were very rapid in few decades, in few decades. And the amplitude of the change was between 6 degree and 16 degree Celsius. It means that now Greenland is warming up since the 60s, two degrees. But during the last, the last glacial period, the amplitude is 6 to 16 degrees. And in very rarely, rarely in few de decades, a, a human generation. If we zoom in on uh, uh, two, uh, two, two cycles, uh, one characterized by uh, a very long uh, temperate phase, eh? You can see here in blue this cycle, a long cycle, that is characterized by a dasgar oesger warming event in a few decades, a progressive uh, cooling, but still relatively high temperature. Hmm? We call the Greenland interstadial, is a phase, and the phase uh, lasted between 2000, uh, sorry, Yes, the, the, the long phase between 2,000 and 3,000 uh, years. This uh, warm phase finished by a precipitous cooling giving way to a cold phase that we call Greenland stadial. But also we have 
dance garage cycles that are much uh, shorter, for instance this one, lasting only 500 years. But anyway, in both cases, the warming event, the change between one state, the cold, and the warm state occur in few decades. I told you that uh, some of the cold phases in Greenland are associated with major ice rafting event. In fact, in this core in front of uh, Ireland, Hermut Henrik discovered several layers um, dominated by uh, core sediment, mainly quartz and carbonates, and also with high percentages of the folar poraminifera pachyderma sinistral. Uh, he um, had three hypotheses for explaining these layers that we call the Henrik layers. One was that this uh, core sediment, sediment was uh, transported by the uh, wind, or the hypothesis this core sediment was transported by the river, and a third hypothesis that this core sediment was transported uh, by the iceberg. In fact, uh, it, a transport of this coarse particle by the wind was impossible because uh, uh, these particles have a size more or less uh, more than 250 micron and the wind is transporting dust. Dust is more or less between uh, 5 microns and uh, 50 microns. Therefore, the wind was impossible. This, this hypothesis, hypothesis was impossible. The other possibility was the river, but the problem is that the core was located in a sea mount. Therefore, the particles cannot uh, go up into the mountain, you know, to be uh, uh, released up in the summit of the mountain. The only possibility was the, uh, that this uh, sediment was transported by the iceberg. And uh, uh, why, uh, more or less, every 7,000, 10,000 years, uh, the, uh, the, there, there were this big amount of, uh, of iceberg um, transported to the North Atlantic. There are also several hypotheses for that, but um, there are the, the most common hypotheses are one is because uh, the, during the last glacial period, from the last interglacial, more or less 130,000 years before present, the ice is accumulating little by little, and after this ice, uh, is, uh, uh, is victim of his own success. And the weight of the ice plus the telluric warm of the earth is melting the base of the ice sheet and um, is, uh, is acting as a, is, is, is a slippery a soap. Eh? And therefore, uh, fragmented, there is a fragmentation of this uh, ice and going through uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. The other hypothesis is that uh, um, every 7,000, uh, 10,000 years, there were warm subsurface current coming from the southern hemisphere and attacking the ice shelves. And when attacking the ice shelf, they are creating uh, uh, pathways for the continental ice uh, to go uh, through, um, to enter in the North Atlantic. Okay, this, uh, uh, during this, uh, um, this uh, Henrik event, <coughs> the zone where uh, there were the maximum accumulation of this uh, 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 sediment uh, cores, uh, or core sediment, uh, is between more or less uh, 40 and 50 uh, degree north, and we call this uh, the Rudiman belt. What is important is the impact of this Henrik event, of this arrival of massive iceberg discharges. Because when you have these iceberg discharges in the North Atlantic, it's like, um, like if, if you have a tap of water uh, cooling down on the North Atlantic, is, is the cold water, and this cold water, in fact, is precluding that the Gulf Stream penetrate towards the north. And therefore, there is cooling uh, the North Atlantic in general, but also uh, the um, uh, regions around the North Atlantic, such as Europe and North America. And some modelers, in fact, have uh, forced 
the, the, the climate uh, uh, at present, our, our climate, with an input of uh, uh, colder sea surface temperature. And forcing the model, forcing the present day climate with this uh, cold sea surface temperature, in fact, the, they found that the, 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 the output of the simulation is a, 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 a strong cooling of the atmosphere, and in particular, Western Europe. These uh, abrupt climatic changes uh, that occur uh, during the last glacial period have also punctuated the last one million years. Hmm? But I'm going to focus now only in uh, the last uh, glacial period, hmm? between the last interglacial, 130,000 years before present, and our present interglacial that started 12,000 years before present. These uh, uh, changes that uh, has been discovered for the first time in uh, Greenland and uh, in the North Atlantic um, are global. Are global because you have also the same changes in Antarctica and also you are recorded by changes in, the atmos in, in carbon dioxide, in the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide. And also very well recorded in the uh, changes in the concentration of the atmospheric methane. And what is very interesting to see as well is that when the northern hemisphere is very cold, hmm, here with this Henrik event, hmm, Antarctica is warming. It's what we call the CISO mechanism. I mean that the southern hemisphere is uh, like a, a pirate of the warm. Then there is this asymmetry between the northern hemisphere and the uh, southern hemisphere. It's for the reason that I told you before that one of the hypotheses uh, that explain the generation of Henrik event is that there is the subsurface uh, um, waters uh, uh, going towards the north and uh, breaking the ice shelves. What is the abrupt uh, climate change, the definition? Uh, the first definition was given by Alain saying that the change that takes place more rapidly than the underlying forcing. The problem is that we don't know a priori what is the forcing of this abrupt climate change. Other, other researcher has defined abrupt change as the combination of the magnitude of the change and the rapidity with which it's accomplished. And for instance, for the Western Mediterranean, uh, Martrat and collaborator have proposed that an abrupt climate change is when the Western Mediterranean is warming up by 0.26 degrees Celsius in 100 years. But unfortunately, our climatic indicators for the past uh, cannot be quantified, eh? cannot be always quantified. And for this reason, we propose another definition, a, a more soft, a softer definition, in which the this abrupt change is, is the change that takes place in less than 200 years and in magnitude exceeds the decadal variability typical of the interval in which it occurs. Okay, therefore, during the last million years, we have two important forcing for the climate system. One is the changes in Earth orbit, and the other is the millennial scale climatic variability. Eh? And the, both, uh, uh, both um, uh, climatic changes are affecting vegetation, the atmosphere, ice, the ocean, and the land surface. And uh, it, the, it, um, the, they are affecting each of the reservoir, but each reservoir is also affecting the other reservoir uh, uh, by uh, internal interaction, internal feedbacks. It means that the first force forcing can be amplified or reduced uh, mm, to produce the internal responses, the real changes in atmosphere, in ice, in vegetation, in ocean, and in the land surface that, that we see eh, in the paleoclimatic record. You will see much better in my uh, second part of the, of the lecture what I mean by this uh, amplification uh, uh, feedbacks. <coughs> At the end, what we want to know is, in fact, understanding the origin and mechanism of any given rapid climate change. And for that, in fact, we need to know the timing and the response 
to this change in the different Earth reservoirs. And for this reason, we need a common chronology. I mean, we need to know what is the response of the ice, of the sea, of the continent, uh, and to see whether one is responding before the other, eh? uh, face to a, to a, in, a initial forcing. The problem is that the marine sequences have an independent chronology from the ice core sequences or from the terrestrial sequences. And therefore, it's very difficult to establish the leads and lags. And uh, one uh, way to circumvent this problem is, in fact, to work on the pollen from the deep sea sediment. Because in the deep sea sediment, uh, the core that are relatively close uh, uh, to the continent, in the same layer, uh, in the same sediment layer, you have, uh, for instance, the pollen grains indicating vegetation, but also temperature and precipitation, annual and seasonal. You have also dinosis, for instance, or planktonic foraminifera, indicating changes in sea surface temperature, sea surface salinity. You have also in the North Atlantic uh, the ice rough uh, debris indicating the arrival of iceberg, indicating the Henry <coughs> event. But also you have the benthic foraminifera on which you can measure the oxy oxygen isotopic ratio indicating changes in the global ice volume. Therefore, in one layer without chronological ambiguity, we can detect possible time lags or synchronies between the different uh, reservoirs in response to a given climate change. This, I, I'm not ready to uh, speak about that in the second part of my talk. Eh? Before, uh, I would like to show you the regional responses of this uh, uh, millennial scale climatic variability, Dansgaro-Esger cycles and Henrik event, um, and in particular, the response, I'm going to focus uh, uh, on Europe. Because since the discovery of this uh, uh, Dansgaard-Oesger uh, variability and Henrik event, there are still outstanding questions. The regional expression of Dansgaard-Oesger and Henrik event, the atmospheric and oceanic processes associated with this variability, and the interaction with other forcing, mainly the interaction between the millennial scale variability and the orbital parameters. And I will, I will show you some uh, examples of that. For that, um, we have been working since 1995 in uh, several core located uh, in the uh, Western European uh, margin uh, they are strategically located in two regions, the temperate region and the Mediterranean region, two very distinct uh, regions in a climatic point of view and an ecosystem point of view. Uh, these calls were collected in the framework of the international program images. Here you can see uh, most of the calls were collected with the French uh, uh, oceanographic uh, uh, ship, the Marion Dufresne, and here is a giant Calypso core, and this is a part of the core uh, that we uh, uh, have uh, collected. The core can uh, be longer, uh, can, can be uh, 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 72 meters longer, very long in fact. And here you can see the first direct gland C correlation hmm, uh, from the core located in front of Lisbon. Here you can see 140,000 years, the last interglacial, the minimum ice volume or the maximum sea level, the last glacial period, and here our interglacial starting 12,000 years ago with minimum in ice volume. In red, you can see two indicators of changes in sea surface temperature. Here you can see the concentration of the ice rafted debris, indicating that the, that the iceberg arrived to southwestern Iberia hmm, during the Henrik event. 
Here are the percentages of the folar foraminifera pachyderma sinistral, indicating the major percentages of this polar foraminifera uh, occurring during the Henrik event, and at the same time, the evolution of the Mediterranean forest. You can see very, very clearly that during the last interglacial, you have a very important expansion of the Mediterranean forest. It means that we have a very well expressed Mediterranean climate. I mean, warm and dry summers and cool and wet winters during the last interglacial, but also at the beginning of, of our present interglacial. And uh, superimposed to this interglacial, glacial, interglacial variability, you have a lot of fluctuation, I mean expansion and contraction of the Mediterranean forest. You can see that during the Henrik event in blue, but also during the other cold phases uh, that is, are observed uh, in Greenland or in the sea surface temperature record, you can see that there is a, a contraction of the Mediterranean forest. And when there is an increase in the sea surface temperature, you can see an expansion of the Mediterranean forest. I mean that the vegetation responded very quickly to these abrupt climatic changes. The resolution of this analysis is at best 100 years, but it means that the vegetation does not take long in respond to the, abrupt, uh, to the climatic changes. It responds very quickly. Eh? You must know that, in fact, all these abrupt climatic changes, eh, because uh, these climatic changes really uh, uh, transform very quickly the ecosystem, the terrestrial, the, the, the plant and the animal uh, ecosystem, um, um, that the Neanderthals, our ancestor, uh, the Neanderthals and the anatomically modern humans uh, needed to cope with these uh, very abrupt climatic changes. Eh? I mean, uh, really few decades and a large amplitude of uh, climatic changes. This is only to show you uh, the pollen, how uh, it looks like in the Mediterranean forest. Uh, when, you, when, when we identify an expansion of the Mediterranean forest, we have uh, uh, high percentages of pine, evergreen oak, olive tree. And when there is a contraction of the Mediterranean forest, what uh, uh, we see is the development of semi-desert vegetation with sagebrush, ephedra and kenopods this kind of uh, landscape that now exists in Iran and Iraq. They are very, really dry environments, and we also know that they are very windy environments. But we have also analyzed core further north, here at 42 degrees north, and at 45 degrees north, here in front of Galicia, in northwestern Iberian margin, and here a core collected in the Bay of Biscay, eh, close uh, in front of, uh, of, of, of Lotesh, a little bit farther north. And um, what we observe is uh, that uh, there is a contrasting vegetation response uh, following a latitudinal gradient. I mean, in Greenland, you have a very strong warming during Dansgaro Esger 1716, 12, 11, and 8. But in the Mediterranean region, the strong warming is during 16, 17, and 8, 7. And further north, the strongest warming is during 14 and 12. Hmm? It means that, uh, first, why? Why is the explanation? We have explained this contrasting vegetation respon response as the influence of the boundary condition. I mean the influence of the orbital parameters. Why? Because here, at 1716 and 87, we, we are in a minimum imprecision. And the minimum imprecision is creating a very high seasonality. I mean, is amplifying the 
expression of the Mediterranean forest and therefore the expression of the Mediterranean climate. Further north, the maximum of the temperate forest, of the warming, eh, further north, coincide with the maximum in obliquity. In fact, obliquity is mainly influencing the higher latitudes, because when you have the tilt is moving, it's affecting the poles and the higher latitude, but it's very weakly affecting the equator. In fact, what is interesting to see with this comparison is that uh, is, is, in, is in reality the, the regional expression of the climatic change, of a given climatic change. It's not because uh, there is a strong warming in Greenland that we are going to have the same strong warming in other regions. And this is very important because the question of, of the amplitude of the response. Well, here is to show the obliquity and the, pre and the precession. And uh, another interesting thing is that with the pollen assemblages, we can quantify, eh, uh, quantify uh, the, uh, these climatic changes. And for instance, when you are during a Henrik event, when you have in southern, uh, the Southern Iberian Peninsula a semi-desert landscape, uh, you have really very few precipitation, 200 millimeter, in comparison with uh, 600 millimeter today. The same here, uh, 400 millimeter, today 800 millimeter. And further north, uh, taking as an example uh, Western France, uh, now we have 800 millimeters during Henrik event, only 400 millimeter, half of the precipitation. And we will look at the mean coldest winter temperature. Today, the mean uh, winter coldest temperature is 4 degrees. During Henrik event, minus 10 degrees. Then really 14 degrees less in temperature. Very difficult to go uh, surfing eh, in, the, in the Bay of Biscay. Anyway, of course, uh, these values uh, have, un have uncertainties. Eh? Uh, this maybe is uh, minus 10, minus 12, minus 8, but it's only to give you an order of, um, of amplitude of the change. And in the ocean, uh, during summer, you have 0 degrees, 4 degrees, 8 degrees, 12 degrees, in comparison to present. To, uh, at present, we have more or less 18 degrees, 19. Eh? Here, more or less the same, and here you have uh, 21, uh, and here more or less 21 as well. Hmm? Not very cold condition. During Greenland Interstadia, the warming, the temperature and the precipitation are uh, reaching the interglacial values. The conclusion of this first part of my talk is that, that uh, um, um, we have identified uh, rapid, more or less in 100 years, and synchronous <laughs> vegetation responses in Western Europe to sea surface temperature changes and the Dansk Garuesger cycles. That when you have freshwater input, and in particular during the Henrik event, there is a strong forest reduction, and we have semi desert landscapes in Southern Iberia and steppe environments farther north. Eh, like more or less the Central European steppe. And also a very important thing is this regional response of the rapid and abrupt climatic variability eh, with different response in the Mediterranean region and above 40 uh, degree north and also in Greenland. Now I'm going to deal with the oceanic and atmospheric processes during glaciation and ice melting. Uh, and um, first, uh, um, I'm going to, to say again that um, we know that there are changes in the orbital parameters, in the insulation, but we know also 
since the astronomical theory of ice ages by Milankovitch, that the decrease or increase in insulation is not enough to explain the, uh, the strong ice growth and the rapid ice decay. And it's for the reason that we must seek for internal feedbacks eh, um, to amplify the original forcing, external forcing. And these feedbacks can be atmospheric and oceanic circulation, changes in greenhouse gas concentration, also changes in seasonal insulation, but also the millennial scale climatic variability that has been discovered uh, quite recently. Hmm? And uh, <clears throat> for uh, showing, I'm going to show uh, three examples of that. Uh, and one is linked to a very interesting question. How does the Earth enter in glaciation? And despite the present day global warming, could the Earth enter in a new, new glacial period and when? And in fact, uh, this question was studied by a lot of researchers eh? um, um, since, uh, well, yeah, since the beginning of the paleoclimatology, in fact. And, um, but um, mainly these researchers concentrated in the last interglacial period. I mean, the, from the last interglacial to the beginning of the glaciation. <coughs> Why? Because this, uh, for this period, we have uh, much more data that, than for other periods uh, further back in time. Um, and um, these researchers were interested in the, in the climatic variability within the last interglacial, the duration of the last interglacial, and also mainly on the forcing mechanism bringing it to the end. Here you can see uh, the last 200,000 years with changes in insulation. Here there is the change, the, the decrease in summer insulation between 122 and uh, even before 126 to 116. And here is the curve of, change of, the, of increase in ice volume, decrease in sea level. Hmm? And uh, as I told you before, this is not enough, this decrease in insulation to explain this is strong ice growth. Researchers from uh, the Université de Louvain-la-Neuve uh, develop a model, uh, Moby Dick, uh, in which the model is forced by the decrease in insulation, by, by changes in carbon dioxide that I, I, I don't show here, but also this model is characterized by a vegetation dynamic model inside. I mean that the vegetation is changing uh, following the forcing. Eh? And they found that with this decrease in insulation, there was an increase in the fraction of tundra and polar desert, 60 and 90, uh, between 60 and 19 degrees north, uh, now, the limit of the tundra, the southern limit of the tundra is 70 degrees north. It means that the tundra advance, uh, migrate towards the south by 10 degrees. Mm. And at this moment, when there was this increase in the fraction of tundra and polar desert, there was an increase of the surface of peren perennial snow. They explained that, saying that, okay, when there is a decrease in summer insulation, this decrease is produce, producing a shortening of the uh, pre period of growth of plants. And this is affecting mainly the trees. And it's for this reason that the tundra develop. But also what is very important is that when there is a snow falling down over the tundra, the albedo is more than the double that the uh, albedo in the taiga, eh? in the, the uh, albedo uh, uh, produced by the snow on the taiga. 
Therefore, this uh, albedo, that is the quantity amount of energy that the Earth reflects towards the atmosphere, is producing the amplification of the first cooling originated by the decrease in insulation. But these are results of the model and we wanted to, to, to know whether uh, the data uh, confirm, support this hypothesis. And for this reason, we look at uh, most of the, uh, the well-dated uh, pollen sequences uh, in Europe uh, covering the last interglacial. And now I'm going to start with the core that I showed you before, here located in front of Lisbon. And here in blue is the uh, changes uh, in ice volume. Hmm? This is the last interglacial with a plateau. The ice volume here is uh, quite stable. But at 116, there is a thousand years, there is the substantial ice accumulation, yeah, uh, indicating the entering in glaciation. But when we look at the vegetation, we see that at the beginning of the last interglacial, there is the maximum of the Mediterranean forest, I mean the maximum of warmth, also the maximum in sea surface temperature. But as early as 121, before the substantial ice accumulation, the vegetation is changing. I mean that, that in Southern Iberia, you have the decrease in the Mediterranean taxa, and the occ occurrence of Horbim, a tree that is well adapted to cool and wet condition, indicating a slight cooling. Therefore, here at 121, vegetation is already changing, but the ice volume is still stable. In the core located in the Bay of Biscay, we see more or less the same scenario with this plateau in the uh, ice volume, here the substantial ice accumulation. At the beginning of this interglacial you have the maximum of the warmth. Here at 122 you can see uh, the development of the uh, cool tree or beam and also uh, the, the development of the conifers indicating a, a, a cooling. Hmm? And is only at 115 when you have the substantial ice accumulation and the replacement of the temperate forest by the boreal forest. When we look further north, this a, a German sequences located at 52 degrees north is a continental sequences, but it, sequence, sequence, but it's quite well dated. And we can see that at 120, there is the replacement of the temperate forest by the conifer forest. When we synthesize this data, we can see that at the beginning of the last interglacial, we have a distribution of the vegetation belt that is quite similar as the, uh, that at present. Eh? Mediterranean forest up to 42 degree north, deciduous forest after 60 degree north, and the conifer forest up to 70 degree north. But as early as 121, there is a replacement of the conifer forest that uh, is migrating towards the south and uh, arriving at 50 degree north. And probably this displacement of the tundra by 10 degrees towards the south. Unfortunately, we don't have data here, but probably with this migration of the conifer forest, certainly the tundra is also migrating. In fact, it means that uh, um, uh, when you have an entering in glaciation, the vegetation plays a major role eh, in, uh, in this entering in glaciation because it's increasing the albedo uh, effect hmm, and amplifying the original decrease in insulation. The problem is that at present we don't know, uh, we don't see that. On the contrary, we see that the uh, warm species, uh, plant and animals, are going uh, towards the north. Um, and we can, we can say that certainly is because of the global warming. But also 
we can think that uh, the last interglacial is not the best analog to our present interglacial because the orbital parameters are not the same. And it's true because you have here our interglacial is characterized by muted changes in precession and in eccentricity. And stage five, the last interglacial, is characterized by large changes in precession and eccentricity. And for this reason, we have been uh, we have worked on interglacial 11, 400,000 years before present, when you see weak muted changes in precession and eccentricity as our present interglacial. And for that, we, we, we have worked in, a, a, in the core collected in front of Galicia. And first, we, with, uh, uh, what we can see is that this interglacial is very long in time, is the double of the stage uh, of the last interglacial. This interglacial lasted 30,000 years. The last interglacial lasted 16,000 years. Um, also, what we can see is that uh, the maximum of the, uh, of the temperate forest with the warmest foraminifera, the warmest sea surface temperature, occur during 20,000 years, between 425 and 405. And it's only an, an, at 505 when there is a decrease in um, in this temperate forest hmm, and the start of the increase in the conifer forest hmm, and is later when there is the substantial ice accumulation. I mean vegetation is already changing before this substantial ice accumulation. When the modeler apply this, uh, the same model to this stage 11 in fact, they, they found that uh, there was this uh, strong ice accumulation at more or less 3,097,000 years before present, at the time when there was the decrease of the trifraction, I mean, or the increase of the tundra. And this uh, uh, result indicates the major role of vegetation changes in uh, producing the entering in glaciation. The conclusion of this uh, part of the talk is that this major role played by vegetation changes in triggering ice accumulation in general, but also particularly when insulation changes are muted, as the case of the interglacial 11, 400,000 years before present, that is one of the best orbital analog of our present interglacial. It also means that without increasing CO2 concentration with the human impact, we still have 10,000 years ahead before the first signs of glacial accumulation in the northern hemisphere high latitudes. The problem is that uh, stage 11 is a good analog, but it's not the best analog. Because there, there, there is another interglacial, 19, that occurred 800,000 years before present, that seems more appropriate from an astronomical point of view, because in this case, eccentricity, precession, and obliquity are similar. Uh, working on this interglacial, uh, uh, several researchers uh, have shown that this interglacial uh, lasted 12 uh, 12,300 years, and our interglacial started 12,000 years ago. If it's a good analog, we have only th we have only 3,000 years of interglacial without the human impact. Hmm? The problem is that this is oh, sorry, this interglacial, in fact, uh, the climatic variability, the internal climatic variability, is very different of the internal climatic variability of our present interglacial. And as there is an impact of the millennial scale variability, the internal climatic variability, uh, uh, on the orbital variability, we, we don't know if 
this one is also a very good analog. Eh? I think that the message is that in the past it's very difficult to find very good analogs. Anyway, what is important to see is that vegetation is a very important um, uh, factor for entering in glaciation, that uh, vegetation um, mainly in the high latitudes, because they are, they, they are, they are, uh, vegetation has an impact on the albedo, and when people say that we have to plant the trees, certainly in the tropics, but not in the high latitudes. Because also we know that the albedo uh, uh, feedback is more important than the exchange of carbon dioxide, that the, 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 carbo, the di uh, carbon dioxide sink hmm? is more important, the albedo. Now I'm going to uh, deal with another feedback mechanism. Eh? Uh, this one um, uh, has been very well identified uh, during uh, the transition between the last interglacial eh, and the beginning of the last glacial period, more or less between 80,000 and 70,000 kilo years before present. Eh? And this one, this center in glaciation, is one of uh, uh, is the most rapid and large ice sheet growth in the North Atlantic high latitudes of the last uh, half million years. This, has, uh, this transition uh, was studied by uh, Rudiman and McIntyre in the late 70s, and they published a paper in Science with a very paradoxical title. The title was warm on the, on the subpolar North Atlantic during Northern Hemisphere ice growth. Hmm? And uh, they show, this is a figure from, from the article, a modified figure, uh, on which you can see this decrease in summer insulation, the increase in ice volume, is a curve of the oxygen isotopic ratio, and here you can see the sea surface temperature that remain eh, between 54 and 44 degrees north, remain high at 18, 18 degrees Celsius. And they explain the ice growth, saying that uh, in fact uh, at this time there was a strong uh, thermal gradient development between a warm sea and a cold land. And this thermal gradient produced a lot of moisture. This moisture was transported by the storm tracks towards the northern hemisphere high latitudes and there uh, fall as a snow because at that time there was a decrease in summer insulation hmm, at high latitudes. The problem is that at the time uh, they uh, did not um, um, did not have uh, they, they did, didn't have data demonstrating this strong thermal gradient, and also uh, the rapid millennial variability. Uh, they didn't know the existence of this millennial scale climatic variability. They thought that the transition was gradual, but we know now that this transition is punctuated by three cold events and three warming events. And how this millennial variability is acting on the long-term variability, the orbital variability? Both question is that uh, is what I'm going to, to show you uh, with new data, eh, that I, I, I'm going to answer to, to, to this question, both question. For that, uh, we, we work on uh, the core located in the Bay of Biscay, mainly th this one, also uh, the, the, the Galician one, but mainly in that, that of the Bay of Biscay, because this core is located at 45 degrees north, is the area in which Rudiman and McIntyre found warm sea surface temperature. And we analyzed the pollen to infer vegetation and climate, uh, planting for aminifera, for sea surface temperature, other indicators, also the oxygen isotopic ratio for ice volume, and also ice rough debris for freshwater pulses, all in the same sediment layer. And what we 
have observed is that um, the decrease in, in summer insulation, the increase in ice volume, the long-term decrease in temperate forest, indicating a long-term cooling in the, on the continent, and here stable, no stable, sorry, high sea surface temperature, long-term high sea surface temperature. Here in the Bay of Biscay, there is not ice wrapped debris, no iceberg during this transition between interglacial and glacial. In fact, we demonstrated for the first time <coughs> this is the development of a strong uh, thermal gradient between a cold land and a warm sea at orbital scale, at long term. But when we look uh, at the millennial variability, and this is really interesting, is that we observe this uh, decoupling between the land and the sea temperature with the cooling on the continent a warming in the ocean, in the Bay of Biscay, hmm? and this three times. Uh, this uh, uh, indicates that superimposed to this strong thermal gradient at orbital scale, at long term, we have three pronounced increases in the thermal gradient, amplifying the orbital a thermal gradient, the long-term thermal gradient. How can we expect, and, and that is indicating that the production of a very high amount of moisture eh, that was transported towards the north. How can we explain this decoupling in the eastern part of the North Atlantic? In fact, these three events, called events, C20, C19 and C18 prime, correspond with uh, uh, um, moderate iceberg discharges. They are not Henrik event. They are not massive iceberg discharges, only moderate. And these moderate iceberg discharges, the only effect is to push the Gulf Stream towards the European margin. In this case, you have a warm pool eh, in this part of the North Atlantic, but you have the cooling of the continent because at the same time, you know, you have the tundra that is replacing the taiga and producing an amplification of the cooling, but here you have a warming. Hmm? This is the producing a lot of moisture that is transported towards the north, amplifying the growth of the ice. Uh, the same scheme has been observed in the core located in front of Galicia but not in the core located here, further south. And in fact, this indicates that certainly this warm pool, eh, this warm pool uh, certainly uh, uh, was located in the Bay of Biscay and probably further north, but not further south. In conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, our data provide strong evidence for a rapidized growth scenario involving both orbital and suborbital increases of Earth-sea thermal contrast at the, at, the la, at the last interglacial glacial transition. There is an amplification by the millennial scale climatic variability eh, of the uh, orbital force variability. That the warm pool existed in the West European margin, Bay of Biscay and further north. But also a very important question is that the tight coupling between marine and terrestrial temperature responses to the millennial scale cycles is not a pervasive feature throughout the quaternary, eh, throughout the last million years, in the Western European margin, as previously thought. And that we, we can expect this decoupling during over entering in glaciation, and also maybe during the glaciation as well, periods in, uh, in which you don't have a, a, um, uh, a more or less stable ice volume. Hmm? like during the last glacial period, eh, that is more or less stable. Um, for instance, during the, during the last glacial period, you have changes in ice volume that are more or less, uh, if I remember well, 15 meters of sea level. But during the last entering in glaciation, you have 60 meters of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of um, decreased sea level. Hmm? And very quick, in, in 
very, very quick. Finally, a topic a little bit uh, uh, um, a more facial topic because the Greenland melted, you know. Um, and uh, also this, uh, this, this, this topic has been studied by many researchers. And I was interested on that uh, because uh, I observe um, with my data, I observe um, a very interesting uh, feature that I'm going to, to, to tell you uh, now. Uh, I don't know if you have seen The Day After Tomorrow, the movie, uh, in which uh, uh, um, the message of the, of the movie is to say that uh, when you have a lot of fresh water entering in the North Atlantic, uh, for instance, for the Greenland melting of the different glacier that uh, are melting, uh, you have a slowdown, uh, stop of the AMOC, eh, of the Atlantic Meridional Overturn Circulation, and therefore we, uh, we enter in glaciation. And there is also a cooling uh, in general uh, in, uh, in the North Atlantic and, and, and the regions around the North Atlantic and in particular in the western part of the North Atlantic in Europe. The problem is that model simulations are not consistent, but the a priori assumption is that Greenland melting causes reduced AMOC and subsequently European cooling. Um, for dealing with this topic, um, we choose to, uh, to look at the last interglacial again. Why the last interglacial? Because it's the most recent period when North Atlantic summer was warmer than today. Sea level was four to nine meters higher than at present. Uh, if I remember well, from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the sea level has uh, increased at about six centimeters. Uh, the temperature were up to five degrees above the present day values. There was a substantial Greenland melting, the subsequent freshwater input in the North Atlantic, and the vegetation cover southern Greenland. But when I look at the data of this core again in the Bay of Biscay, and I compare with the, the Greenland melting inferred from a core, a sedimentary sequence located south of Greenland, eh, I realize that the maximum temperature forest with the maximum summer air temperature coincide with the maximum Greenland melting. Therefore, it does not coincide with the uh, European cooling, at least the Western European cooling. Uh, at, the, uh, opla, at this moment, uh, there was an AMOC that it was not at its full uh, strength, but it was increasing. And when I, I, I show this data to modelers, uh, they told me, OK, it's fine, it's a nice observation, but you don't demonstrate anything. OK, thank you. And uh, uh, this modeler uh, 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 were working in, um, in the University of um, Amsterdam. Uh, and um, OK, uh, we are going to, to work with you and we are going to, to try to, uh, to see whether this climatic scenario is physically possible. And they, um, it means that the strongest Greenland ice melting at 130 kilo years before present, contemporaneous with an increase but not fully recovered AMOC, and the highest temperature in Europe. And they use another model called uh, uh, Love Klima. Um, that is a, a quite um, good model because uh, the ocean is quite uh, very well represented and also the atmosphere. There is also a module of vegetation and so on. And the carbon cycle. Um, and first they force uh, the, um, the model with the um, insulation at 130,000 years before present. Uh, these anomalies of temperature are anomalies in comparison with the pre-industrial. Are, they are uh, summer anomalies, summer air temperature anomalies. And you can see that the Europe 
is very warm and also Greenland and North America. And why? Because uh, during the last interglacial, in the peak of the interglacial, insulation is much higher than the insulation now. Okay, then this is normal. But after they uh, force the model with a realistic freshwater input, freshwater flux hmm, from the Greenland melting. And if uh, at this, uh, in this situation, you have the deep water formation the, in the Nordic seas, north of Iceland, and in the Labrador seas, in this situation, with the fresh water input, you have only the, um, the, the, the deep water formation in the Nordic seas. It means that the AMOC is uh, working quite well in the Nordic Seas and therefore is still warm in Europe. But this is not the case for the western part of the North Atlantic where there is a cooling in the sea surface temperature. We have data showing that there is a cooling in the sea surface temperature. Uh, in conclusion, what we see is that uh, uh, Loveclim simulation suggests that Greenland ice sheet melting inhibited deep convection of the southern coast of Greenland and in the Labrador Sea, slightly decreasing the AMOC by more or less 24% of its present strength. But this melting the, of green, Greenland did not affect nor the Nordic seas deep convection leaving temperature in Europe unaffected. Future Greenland ice sheet melting may be associated with warming temperature in Western Europe and certainly is incapable to counterbalance the effect of the rising anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentration. Hmm? Uh, recently, uh, there were two papers in Nature showing that in fact now um, uh, there is a decrease in the AMOC by more or less 14-15% uh, 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 in in, uh, of, of its strength. The only problem is that in one study, this decrease in the AMOC, that maybe is the Greenland melting, eh, uh, is before the pre-industrial times, and in the other study, is during pre-industrial time. And therefore, we don't know if is a question of what is the cause of this uh, uh, decrease of the AMOC. Hmm? Duncan, a uh, more general question is uh, to say that uh, the rapidity of fast climatic changes, less than 100 years, duration of a human generation, very important, the regionalization of the global warming. I mean, the response is different following the region, and this is the main concern of the GIEC of the IPCC today, eh? really to identify the response of the global warming. Uh, that also the climate of the past is a key for understanding the present day and future climate, because we are dealing with feedback processes, and they are very important, without any anthropo anthropic uh, impact, eh? the natural climate system. And also it shows that the Earth climate system is like a living organism, in fact, no? that is continuously ch changing. Eh? that the constant of the climate is, if is, if is change. Eh? Uh, thank you very much. And have any questions? <laughs>